The views and opinions expressed in Media Litter Sandwich do not reflect on the views of the network, station, studio, website, sponsors, guests, hosts themselves, anyone or anything else associated or even not associated with this podcast. Maybe not even the person that said them. In other words, do your own research and do not sue anyone over what is said on this show. Welcome to Toden's Media Litter Sandwich. And I am, of course, Toden from Toden.com or Media Litter Sandwich.com. Either one, you can see the whole backlog of the podcast in either one with the video and the audio. But if you just want the audio, you can go use whatever podcast app you want. And why do I say that when you're already listening? Because if you share this, if you like this at all or know someone that would probably like this, go ahead and share it and they know they can watch future episodes on YouTube or the website or whatever podcast app that you listen to, whether it be Spotify or Mixcloud or whatever, we're probably on it. So with me today is Reed Alexander and you do many different things is what you're telling me. And are they all horror related or just some of them? They're, they're all horror related. Yeah, like even even my visual arts, which is like we were just talking about earlier, that's the the least of my my uh, my disciplines is, is pretty horror related. If you ever go take a look at them. Okay, so let's go through the list of what you're doing. You're you're blogging, you're podcasting, you're writing, you, you're published. Yes. Uh, and and uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, the, the only thing outside of that is like, I think that me and, uh, the guy I'm, I'm, I'm currently podcasting with or, or talking about maybe doing like some let's plays, you know, like, uh, let's play aliens isolation, let's play the SCP foundation, you know, doing some, t- some Twitch streams, but, uh, that, that we're probably just going to add that to, to our, our podcast. Anyway, so like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Make it another thing, um, <laughs> which could be fun. Uh, so, okay. so, so what exactly, how, where, where are we at? Is that all to say, I know you're doing horror reviews and then you're writing your own horror stuff. Go ahead, introduce yourself. Give me your spiel, man. All right. I'm Reed Alexander. I'm the foul mouth horror critic. Um, about uh, two years ago, I published a book through Madness Hard Press called In the Shadow of the Mountain, which is Lovecraftian theme. It was kind of, uh, I don't know if you're going to have video up, but there it is. It, it video little- version is different than the audio version. So <laughs> anyone's listening on radio, um, which that's where we air first is dvradio.net, Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard right. Time, uh, where I should be in the chat room. So if you're not listening to this on there, you can pull up the video version. And if you are listening to this on there, Wait a week and then go watch this again on the video because it's <laughs> it's it's way different. Or you can go over to the Patreon and I will go ahead and put the video up on there if you are a Patreon person, which I do understand times are tough. But look at the tiers. Um, and if you can't do that, just share it and maybe I could do some more stuff later on. Anyways, go ahead. Sorry. So no, that's no, fine. It's fine. I, I was uh, published about a year ago. I, I've been doing the the horror review <clears throat> for about eight years at that point. Um, it started, it was dumb, right? So like, I I decided I was going to do a blog and I I don't even know what inspired this, but one day I sat down, I'm like, I'm going to do a blog. Um, my opinions are so important. And I sat down and I started doing a political God to be good, uh, you know, like, uh, throwing my, my, my extreme liberal mouth all over the, the internets. And, um, nobody cared. Nobody, nobody subscribed. Nobody even looked at, I think I had 10 total followers for like a whole bloody year. But someone put out um, a movie. It was a, an Italian adaptation of um, Color Out of Space by H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, I believe it was Color from Out of the Dark or just Color from the Dark. And I loved H.P. Uh, Lovecraft's Color Out of Space. It's one of my favorite uh, uh, horror novels, novella. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, uh, I watched it and I was really taken by it. And I left uh, like a three sentence review. It's like, yeah, pretty close to the book. Pretty interesting. I liked it. I liked their adaptation. A billion friggin' hits. And I was just like, oh, maybe I'm, I'm on to something here. I've always been a, a big horror head. 
Um, I watch almost strictly horror movies because I am shamelessly incorrigible about my love of horror. Uh, and uh, the, the rest was sort of history when it came to the, to the review blog. Like the first one just got a dozen more hits than any other thing that I'd ever posted. And people seemed to be way more interested in horror. And there was a whole community for it. And I just started doing reviews. And over time, they got more elaborate. And over time, they be start, I started to sort of take them seriously and do them professionally. And then eventually, little indie horror people started asking me to do reviews. Uh, and around that time, I'd already started to write. Um, because I, you know, from all the horror movies I, I consume, I have terrible nightmares. Uh, and uh, I love them. I think it's like I get my own personal horror movie to myself that nobody else gets to see. It's great. Right? Um, and uh, I was just like, well, hey, that was pretty interesting. I'm going to write that down. Now, I had been writing for years before this, but no one had ever even kind of taken a second look at me. And when I started doing my nightmares, uh, you know, their people started to slowly take interest in it. They thought it was kind of fascinating. And I put them in the notes in my, my horror review on Facebook. Uh, and eventually a publisher approached me and he's like, hey, would you be willing to do a book review as opposed to just movies? And I'd never done it before. I was like, yeah, screw it. And um, after a while of doing reviews for him, I was like, hey, you know, I've got these things. You want to check them out and see if you like them? Uh, and he was very taken by them. <clears throat> and that's how I got my first book, In the Shadow of the Mountain, uh, by me, Reed Alexander, published. Um, and it, it, it helped that I already had a fan base for my reviews. It helped that I already had a lot of people sort of interested in who I am through my reviews. Uh, and the fact that my reviews are really more about being entertaining than they are about having an opinion. I, I just, I want my audience to kind of get a chuckle out of them uh, and maybe think, you know, like I can be really harshly critical depending on the, the subject. Um, but I just want people to, to laugh. Uh, and. Uh, I, I kind of got the moniker of the foul-mouthed horror, horror critic uh, because I swear a lot in, in most of my reviews, especially if I don't like it. If I, if I hate the movie... Now, these reviews gotta, are written in a blog form. Oh, they're all written in a blog. You can you can find Reed Alexander's horror review on Facebook. You can't really blame Tourette's for that. <laughs> no, I don't. I'm, I'm, I don't really have Tourette's. I'm just, I've, uh, I swear like a sailor. I come by it honestly, and uh, I, oh. I've never edited myself. You know, uh, I, 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 being someone that's had sailors tell me to uh, line up on the cussing, I, I, I understand <laughs> that that's happened more than once. The first time I, I cussed at them and then kicked them out of my warehouse. Um, <laughs> Marine Corps veteran, so. Uh, thank you for your service, by the way. Um, so the, uh, the, the foul mouth horror reviews, um, I, I think probably, I, I, they took me from like 300 followers at one point to like 40,000 followers. Um, and I don't get a ton of activity, but I get way more hits on, on everything I post than I, than I used to before that. And I follow the metrics like psychotically because I have a business mind, so I care about it. I, I obsess over it. I'm like, how do I get more people to pay attention? Mm -hmm. um, and then I got published uh, through Madness Hard Press uh, with my first novella, In the Shadow of the Mountain. Uh, and then from there, um, and this is funny because Madness Hard Press was not technically the first place that published me. They were the first place that agreed to publish me. But around the same time, a gentleman from um, a magazine, <clears throat> and it was this small easy and it was indie, uh, was just like, hey, I, I saw you had a couple of short stories in your notes. Um, uh, we're doing uh, some horror stuff for one of our, our, our literary uh, magazines. You want to send it to me? And I was like, hell yeah. But and this like happened in the course of a week. And then we became like really good friends. Uh, and then later on down, uh, he decided to liquidate the magazine because he just didn't really want to do it. It wasn't wasn't really fulfilling to him. And then we started doing the podcast. Uh, and it turns out he is just as huge a horror head as me. Um, and uh, I kind of took him under my wing to get him like, you know, like the, the really crazy indie shit that nobody ever sees. And um, 
he loved it. And we started doing a, a podcast together and we, we started talking about it in, in November. Uh, we started coming up with a plan in December and I'd done business research like for this back in September. And then like in January, we, st we started putting it together. And then we did our first episode at the end of January. Uh, then COVID hit and all of a sudden we're like, we're doing what everyone's doing at the exact same time. Because yep. People are stuck in their house. They need content. And like, everyone's just like, well, fuck it. I'm going to do a, I'm going to do a podcast. So like, we like literally, we caught the wave of the big podcast revival um, right at the very beginning. It was like perfect timing, which was kind of funny. <laughs> um, but we're still small. We're still picking up steam. Right. We've only, we've only just breached 180 hits on an episode. Very oh. nice. That's, hey, you know what? If I pick any one of my sources, I probably don't get that per episode. I have to add everything together, <laughs> which is yeah, really, no. really disheartening for something that when I used to get like thousands of views overnight back in yeah. before 2017. It's very, you know, for someone that used to be able to pay their uh, uh, rent off of YouTube, now I'm like, you're never going to see that again. <laughs> I tried to do a YouTube vlog. When I was uh, along the way of me doing my horror yeah. reviews, someone's just like, hey, you need to do video reviews and reactions. And I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. And then like Universal Studios threatened to sue me and then Fox Century threatened to sue me. And, like, yeah. Netflix was like the final straw where like, because eventually what would happen, because I would do the video and there would be like, it's just like, oh, you stream the whole movie. And I'm like, dude, I streamed my face. You can't hear the movie. And I cut the whole thing down to 15 minutes. Believe me, I didn't stream your movie. Um, <laughs> and like Fox and Universal were cool about it. But Netflix so you, was, like, was it one of those things where you'd show clips of the movie and, and, and your face is over? So you're not even showing any clips of your of your face you or of the movie. You sometimes kind of hear like a split second sound clip in the background. Sometimes. Dude, and this validates like an entire series. I <laughs> did. People, people get so mad too. Like, 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 forget about the actual production companies that the people themselves, like, why didn't you just show the whole movie? Like, yeah. what I was doing was I had the video camera on uh -huh. my nephew and myself that were doing reactions. We are wearing headphones, so yeah, that's yeah, how yeah. we're that's how we're hearing the movie. Yeah, like, yeah we're yeah. listening to the whole movie on headphones. Uh, brought my headphone amp. So if anyone else wants to jump in, like here, here's a set of headphones, you know, and we had a couple boom microphones set up um, for us. And people were like, no, to do a reaction, you have to show the whole thing. It's like, no, dude, you can't. It's we tell you when to hit it, <laughs> you know, especially when we did Fuller House, because so many people do, did the full, uh, <laughs> you know, did the, did the little box in the corner of the things. Like, no, yeah, we're not yeah, doing yeah. that because I'm monetized. I'm, yeah, I, 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 I'm going to stay monetized. I'm in good standing. I'm not jeopardizing this. Yeah. Now, I might do something in the future for a Patreon thing or a small crowd. Um, not for public release. I don't know. I have to, the, 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 there are ways to do it legally, but as long as it's never re-released afterwards, one time thing and then done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I think you can do a live stream as long as it's never a permanent fixture. Like, you can live stream something once, but you're not allowed to record it and make it permanent. And then after that, it has to disappear. Um, and then, and like there's every, more to it than that because you'd yeah. still want, because you're rebroadcasting it, you'd still want a license for it because yeah. there's people that get striked um, by providing commentary to award shows. And stuff. There's a lot of people that get away with it, but there are people that they strike within five minutes. You know, um, they're like, "Oh, you're showing our award show. You have, you know, you actually have a following, and then they'll strike you." Um, yeah, 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 that's yeah. why doing that over a private thing where you don't have, where it's a lot harder for them to 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 get to you, um, is one thing. But there's are also legal ways to do it. Uh, but broadcasting live on something like YouTube and Facebook is We're not great. something I'm able to ever afford. Yeah, it's, <laughs> Maybe it's, a, a group less than 50. I can, pr I can afford that depending on what's going <laughs> on. I've done, I could do a live one like that <laughs> at a convention or a trade show. I could do that. I've done that. that that's yeah. easy. 
that, you know, depend if that's just, that's maybe a $75 license. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. That you can do. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I thought it was crazy because like, you know, I, I, I got, like I said, like uh, universals and, and Fox both came after me at one particular point and they were highly satisfied with my response. It's like, dude, it's 15 minutes. There's no actual uh, footage like back off. And they did. Yeah. But when I did um, the perfection for Netflix, um, I, at this particular point, I'd been threatened so many times. I literally had a broiler plate response. Uh, and I, I said, the I do too. Thing. I get so many copyright yeah. claims, copyright yeah. claims over things that I've bought, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so like I, I'm not I, saying bought a CD. I'm saying bought a license. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like you have the license for it. Right. Yeah. So like I sent the boilerplate response. It's just like the, there, we don't show the movie. There's no sound clips. Everything's edited down to like literally 15 minutes of just my response. The only place the, the, the movie even shows up is in the name of the review. That's it. And they faulted me and refused to back down. And I was just like, you know what, Netflix? And I walked away. And it's like, there's like maybe 15 videos that are still on Rita Alexander on YouTube, but I'm I'm literally never using it again. I'm like okay. pr- practically boycotting it because I just, it's too much headache to constantly, constantly get violated for literally never breaking the actual. No, I, I, I got you. I, I try to do like a MST3K series, which is <laughs> so fun. Only using public domain things. Yeah, seriously. I can't even monetize those because there's so many people trying to claim them. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. It, like like these are pu- like no, this is public domain. Oh, you get like, here's all the things. Do not care. Like, and YouTube no would be like, "Yep, you're good." Not even like ten minutes go by, and I get another claim from someone else. Yeah, and then you know, take care of that. Then another one, like all, like just bots is like, nope, so and so has this, and they, uh, you know, and they have us on the bot system. So now you're like just over and over and over again. It's it's ridiculous. And it's like, and YouTube is wondering why they're struggling to actually stay relevant. And it's well, you're struggling to stay relevant because you. Oh, YouTube knows. Yeah, YouTube knows what's going on. It's, I mean that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> it's well, ridiculous. Like, you know what, for, you know, oh, I, I, I could go off for hours on, 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 on YouTube and, and, and their boycotts against creators that made them. And still <laughs> people aren't coming to YouTube for CNN clips. They're coming. Yeah. For, <laughs> how is that so hard to understand? Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, like you, you guys made this. How do you not get how it works? You know. <laughs> if you like to know what we just talked about, go to the Patreon because there's going to be an uncut version. But we're going to yeah, yeah, yeah. jump back into the horror reviews, horror stuff. I'm curious, um, what you review? Like, do you always review? We well, say you review like indie stuff too. Like, how do you I find try what to, to review as much as possible? So I think probably. Um, my, the best position for a horror critic to be in is to amplify really good cult or really good indie productions. Um, I, I have to name drop here because I love the guy, um, Eric oh, Christopher uh, Myers, uh, the director of Butterfly Kisses, um, who hopefully I'll get a chance to introduce you to at some point. Uh, I, he, he just approached me one day. It's like, hey, you're a critic. You mind checking this out and uh, leaving a comment about it? I was just like, yeah. So I, I did. I checked it out, and I was really taken by it. Um, it's a beautiful um, mockumentary uh, about the from the found footage genre. Uh, they came up with a really cool like mythos, um, and it's not just him and Butterfly Kisses, amazing movie, but like there was also uh, the possession of David O'Reilly. Nobody knows who that is. It's an amazing uh, found footage uh, 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 <coughs> possession film. You've got like the yellow brick road, like this little indie production, which was also done as found footage. I swear to God, there's little indies that aren't found footage, but it's the easiest and cheapest way to develop it sometimes. Oh, absolutely. I think um, probably the the only indie uh, movie that I did uh, recently, um, there was two. Uh, there was Hellfire 2015, which was fantastic. It's like Smoking Aces meets The Omen. It's, it was so much fun. 
uh, one, probably one of the best grindhouse I've ever seen. Uh, and they do it in a grindhouse style. It was absolutely incredible. So if you haven't seen Hellfire 2015, see if you can find a copy of Hellfire okay. 2015. I might have to send you my uh, uh, my, my uh, um, found footage uh, suspense movie, which came out before several things that are very similar to it came out. Someone straight up told me that uh, movie ripped me off, and I I, I don't think so because it was an easy concept. But yeah, I might have to send that to you because it came out like two years out. before a major production came out, pretty yeah. much doing the same thing. <laughs> oh, actually, it's funny. Um, I just I wrote a book, um, like uh, about six months ago called Parabiosis. I finished it and I sent it to the publisher, and it's going to be released twenty twenty one. And parabiosis happens at the bottom of the Challenger Deep uh, in an experimental laboratory. And uh, the when I literally, as I'm finishing up the last like a couple chapters, uh, I see the first review for Underwater, and I'm like, "Fuck!" <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just in the ethos, man. Like you know, out there in in like you know, like the the, the umbra, the the, uh, the ethereal plane, you know. Like people just get the ideas at the same time. They write amazing stuff. Like you know, everyone's scared of the the, the dark. Everyone's scared of, of the water. Mm-hmm. Like you know, if, if there are similar themes in the unknown, guaranteed someone's already writing about it. Like while you're doing it. Uh, yeah. So uh, I actually I I thought Underwater was kind of a fun movie. I thought they could have done better. Uh, Kristen Stewart did an amazing job. So you have this ongoing series. You're yeah. continuing writing the blog. You're doing a podcast. Mm-hmm. During this time, are you working? I mean, this is my job. You know? This is this your is job. I, this is what you do full time. This is how I make my money. You know, um, I, I, I'm not living like a prince. But I'll, I just be bluntly honest with you right now. It's a living. It's not a good living. I'm struggling. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but, I, I still need to learn how to be like a trophy husband or something. <laughs> uh, clearly, if if uh, for for the people who get the video, I am I am not a handsome man. <laughs> I could. I, it's like it's like freaking Patrick Stewart and um, maybe like Uncle Fester's love child. Like I'm not. <laughs> Hi, Uncle Fester. Day. By the way, yeah. Uncle Fester is a, a, an amazing. There is um, um, a DV Uncle Fester that is amazing. That, that that's his that's his handle yeah. uh, that hangs out in the chat rooms and and pushes us. He and he sent me coffee not too long ago, so <laughs> he's awesome. I know you're talking about a different Uncle Fester, but you know what? He he'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all right. That's all right. So yeah, like, you know, and I mean, COVID hit me pretty hard. Like I had a book tour uh, lined up throughout the entire summer. I had at least 12 events lined up. I have exactly one left in October. One. So like, I, I may, I made most of my money last year at events uh, because, you know, I'm indie, I'm small. A lot of people don't know who I am. So if I get to actually physically meet people, that's where I sell the most books. That's where I get the most people visiting my blog. That's how the most people sign up for my Patreon. I have my own Patreon, um, which is Reed Alexander, probably somewhere on there. It might take you a bit to find it because it's pretty buried. Um, you know, like this is, that's how I make, you know, my living. And uh, when basically the first four uh, events uh, for my book tour got canceled, I was just like, oh. Uh, and I scrambled because I was I've been trying my best to already make an online presence. And at some point, I fully expect that I'm going to move all of my business online, uh, where literally I'm only going to be uh, doing events outside of my online sales. Um, like I said, I'm a businessman. So like I always think about these things in terms of, of business cost and profit. Oh, thank you. Weird. So, um, anyways, uh, you know, I, I wasn't ready to go full online sales yet. Like, I wasn't expecting to literally be forced by a worldwide pandemic to do that. Yeah. And I caught myself kind of scrambling. And so the first four events got canceled, and I'm scrambling to go online. 
And then like the next four events got canceled and I'm scrambling to like improve my, my online presence. Yeah. And then like uh, the last couple of events got uh, canceled and then I was just like, fuck. But like, I, it, it, I do have some level of success. Uh, I know what I'm doing. So like, it's not like it's, it, it, it cut into my numbers, but it's not, it wasn't the end. You know what I mean? It just made things rough. <laughs> yeah. So, so with the, um, the horror stuff, I say yeah. stuff, but like, they're all completely different things. Yeah. yeah. What What's keeping you like, 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 do you have like a time management thing? Like, okay, this day I write about this and then I'm going to go, then I'm going to read and talk about this in a week or something. Like, like, like how do you have a schedule to help you keep on task? Cause, cause you got oh, like, yeah. you're juggling. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I've absolutely got a schedule. So it's, um, so Sunday we record, uh, from, from Monday, the following week. So it's not like the next Monday, it's the yeah. next Monday. Um, so that's the podcast um from between like monday that week when the that the the last podcast is released um i do site development for the website for the podcast uh and it's literally just like five minutes here or there it's not a big deal um and then you know by wednesday i have to do a review uh so i watch a horror movie and i write down my thoughts um uh thursday uh is a review that i've already done from last wednesday and then that's posted uh uh, that thursday uh and then and actually everything is is actually uploaded on sunday but then it's not posted until thursday yeah uh so i it's it's a it's a complicated schedule where literally everything happened a week ago (laughs) Oh no, I get it. Sometimes I'm like two months ahead and I just got one podcast and I have to like, wait, wait, what's being post? Uh, okay. DV radio is getting this episode. YouTube's getting this episode and I'm scheduling going to be doing this episode. Which ones have I edited so far? Let's see. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, and that was like, wait, wait, what? So we actually, me and my, me and my boy, uh, Joe Kronosik, I have referred to this week specifically as hell week. Um, uh, I missed an entire week like um like halfway through march and i was already kind of behind uh because uh, i was sick for another reason and then uh two weeks ago i came down with COVID 19 uh and i was just literally in bed all day long all the time and i didn't even start getting back into the swing of things until like the third day from the end of COVID, and that meant like we missed um, an entire week of recording, which means like that Sunday we had to record for literally that Monday when it's usually offset by a full week. So that Sunday we sat down, we started recording uh, the episode for that Monday and it got eh. So we had to re-record that episode that Wednesday when I'm already doing my reviews and stuff for the, for the next week. <laughs> And then we had to record the episode because that, that was, that was the episode we recorded Wednesday for the previous Monday. And then we recorded that one. Now we have to record the episode for next Monday. And then Sunday we have to record the episode for the following Monday. And then we're doing an interview with Eric Christopher Myers. And then I have to do this interview. And then we had to sit down with Carrie Means, the voice of Frylock and write a contract to get him to set up for us some stuff for like, um, he's, we, we, we hired Her- Carrie means to do the, the intro outro of our, of our uh, podcast. Nice. Uh, great guy, by the way, amazing voice actor. Frylock was always one of my favorite characters. And, uh, and so like this all happened in the span of seven days. Wow. And, and we're just like no, zero chance to breathe, zero room to breathe. And that's all thanks to, to me being held up for two weeks with COVID-19. So we, we've been referring to it as hell week. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I keep busy. I keep very busy. Oh, man. So what's something... Um... So where do you find these movies at? Like, I know there's a lot of indie horror streaming services now. Do you have like subscriptions to these? Or are you just like, oh, let's see what's on Amazon Prime this week? 
Yeah, yeah. Actually, someone taught me some Amazon foo that I will now depart on you. So I have multiple friends who are really big into freaky weird shit, uh, and like indie horror movies and stuff. <clears throat> and uh, my friend Beth told me, go on to Amazon, find something you like, then click on the other people who liked this watched. Find one of those that looks interesting and then click on that one and then click on the other people who like this watched and then keep doing that. And it's like, dig, just keep digging and you will find the freakiest crazy shit. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's some really weird stuff. Uh, there was, there was this indie called low, which I swear to God was just this production from the kids who usually do Shakespeare in the park. Uh, did a horror movie about a guy trying to convince a demon to get his girlfriend out of hell. <laughs> and it's really funny. <laughs> and the production quality is awful. And it all takes place in a single room. Um, and, uh, but it was, it was, it was cute. Uh, it's a little uh, cornball romance for me. So like, it wasn't really my favorite thing, but literally the production quality was Shakespeare in the park. I'm not even joking. Uh, and that was, that was, that was some fun stuff. Um, so like, yeah, sometimes it's just, you, you just dig, you know, on the internet, you dig as deep and as hard as you can. Every now and then I would remember like movies that I would rent, uh, from like, uh, video stores when I was like a little kid and I was like, Hey, whatever happened to that? And I'd have to go find a place that's illegally streaming it because it's never been transcribed onto like DVD ever. Yeah. And so someone literally has like a VHS copy that they illegally downloaded onto something and you have to find that. Oh, Star uh, Wars holiday special. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. So there there were like some some legends back in the days and their their credo was shoot no matter what, film no matter what, do whatever it takes to make that movie. And there was of course patient zero for that for that ethos which was uh, Ed Wood. Uh, <laughs> but then you had John Waters and guys like Lloyd Kaufman, where it's just like... Which I did interview Lloyd Kaufman a few months ago. Oh, he's such a great guy. I used to do a convention. All right, this is going to sound dumb. But um, when I was young, I used to do conventions, not as a writer, not as a horror guy, uh, but as uh, one of those uh, sword dealers that you'll see at like Comic-Con or like, you know, fan conventions. Me and my dad had a business. We'd go from convention to convention. And we'd sell swords. And we didn't sell that cheap. We didn't sell that like stainless steel, snap it over your knee garbage. We sold the real thing of uh, like a uh, uh, high temper, uh, carbon steel, uh, authentic uh, folded Japanese samurai swords. And yeah, some pretty, we sold garbage too. But like, you know, we, we were like, hey, this is like 50 bucks. What do you want? Um, so like, uh, I met Lloyd Kaufman, uh, in, in icon in Stony Brook, Rhode Island, Long Island. And he was just the coolest guy. And he's just like, dude, how old are you? I'm like 15. He's like, here, here's a copy of the killer condom. I'm like, yes. Like he was, he was such a, he <laughs> Oh was, my God. If I got a copy of that when I was 15, you'd be, yeah. you'd be my hero. Yeah, no, he would be he was, so was, much my hero. Impressed. The guy, he was, he had like half of his staff there with him just promoting. Um, I think they were doing like one of the toxic Avengers at the time. The, 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 the time frame is really iffy for me. I don't really remember it. I met, I met a lot of cool people doing the sword thing, actually. Uh, Lloyd Kaufman. I met Elvira. Um, I met um, Kevin Sorbo, of all people. Uh, I met the guy who did uh, Shepard from, from Firefly, uh, just tons and tons of weird people I've met over, over the years, you know, doing the, the sword conventions, uh, or the sword table at conventions. Uh, I, I kind of put it away a long time ago. Um, like uh, the Yeah, because it's harder to do that now. Like even at, at anime conventions, like you can only, they, they have to only bring like more of the cheaper prop type swords. And Yeah, it's a problem. And, and the, one of the biggest problems is because the production companies that actually make the, the swords, um, the material costs are, are continually going up and, you know, the production costs are continually going up. And that, that reflects in your price. And it's really hard to, to get an affordable piece of, and it's really hard to justify buying like a seven foot broadsword. You are never going to use, regardless of how fucking cool that is, 
Uh, so, you know, it's, it's like, you know, for, for a lot of, um, and then the East coast, uh, convention basically started banning us, uh, because there were a lot of people with some shitty practices. They just didn't, they're selling like daggers to like five-year-olds, you know, they're all, oh, wow. Yeah. They were awful. Um, and, uh, you know, like the, the more reputable vendors, you know, obviously if you were constantly in competition with those assholes. Uh, and trying to, to 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 sort of bring a better reputation to to the the whole carny feel to it, uh, and then you know eventually like the the conventions got sick of like you know constant violations and dangers to other people and you know just assholes being like irresponsible. Once you've sold it, it's like uh, t- the sword, like they'll run around with the blade out, like oh look how cool I am. Oh man, and um. <laughs> You know, so like the East Coast pretty much banned all of us, uh, except at the really, really, really expensive ones that we could never really afford to go to because the sales never justify it. Like we could do like a world con, but it's like uh, almost like 500 bucks a table. Uh, If you do a booth, it's like a grand, but you get a couple tables, but it's still it's like a grand, you know. So now you have to make a grand to to justify even going dragging cons on a lottery so there's no way in hell we're ever going to get into there um and then like um all the other smaller ones were just like no so that was it and so you still moved- go to cons now with your books and do yeah, the- yeah. what's the difference I, I, how do you compare <laughs> that nobody likes to read <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't. Let, well, I, I, I asked the Kaju uh, a poet a couple similar things. <laughs> he, he had some choice things to say. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's this weird paradigm, right? Um, like fans um, are not opposed to buying books. Uh, as a matter of fact, like I said, for the longest time, I was wait- making most of my sales at, at events. Uh, because meeting me in person and having me talk about the book really kind of gets people interested into it. And that'll draw a crowd and then they'll all buy. Um, but like, you know, um, it's, it's, there's this sort of weird struggle where some people only want to buy ebooks. So why waste the extra money on the physical book? And then you have book snobs who only want the physical books. And they refuse to buy the ebooks. It's weird. So there's this like strange dynamic. Well, you um, want to hold I, the physical copy. I, 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 you know, I am totally one of those people. If I read something, like if I read an ebook and I, or if I read it by hand, I those are two totally different messages. As uh, a former very avid comic book reader, that yeah. at one point couldn't afford the comic books anymore, so I did the ebooks. There's you know, in comic book groups, I always knew who wrote, who read the eBooks because they would always be missing stuff. Like something about what was going on in the book went over their heads. And yeah, I'm like, but- oh, these guys are idiots. And then when I started doing it, I felt it. Like I was talking to like, I missed a lot. Somehow yeah. there was a message in there that I missed. And you only seem to really get it is if you're holding the book in your hand. Now, I'm not sure. Now, I do a lot of audio books, so I have no idea if, I, if that's the same thing when I'm listening to an audio book versus a, a book in the hand. But it, I, I know I get more than the person that's doing the ebook because I think a lot of it is just trying to get through it or something. I don't know. But I mean, I make more money selling the physical copies, so I certainly yeah. do not mind. <laughs> But like, you know, I, 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 I just say I understand the book snobs that want the physical copy because there, yeah. there's definitely a difference in retention and understanding. Yeah, it's weird, not for right? everyone. Don't don't throw stuff at me unless oh, it's, it's good food. It's a generational thing. It's absolutely a generational thing. Like I find, like um, about the age of 25, maybe 27 and down, uh, they really they're really into ebooks and they they retain that information well. Uh, and and then ab- above that, it's like they want the physical thing. And like I said, I make more money off the physical copy, so I certainly don't mind. Um, yeah, when I would review books, I actually if, if the book was under like two hundred pages, I'll just print it out. Yeah, cool, very cool. Yeah. So and then uh, I'll burn it when I was done. So <laughs> I love it. So um, when I when I go to conventions, uh, I'm not gonna lie, like um, nobody goes to the book table. Like literally nobody. 
they'll walk right by you if you don't talk to them, if you don't engage in them. Uh, and I, and I, I hate to be the jump out in your face sales guy, but if, if as long as you're pleasant, as long as you're excited, uh, they'll be excited. Uh, if you're like uh, friendly, they'll be friendly. Uh, and if they say no and they walk by, you just you know, say, hey, no big deal, smile and wave, and they walk by. But you know, at, at those conventions, you can actually approach them. You can start a conversation with them. Uh, and you can get them interested in not just your book, but also you. Uh, and I think that makes them more comfortable to, to make a purchase. Because if you're an author at a table, you cannot just sit there. People will walk right by you. Nobody cares about books. Uh, so in, but people don't not like reading. People just don't. Dude, they're there for like, they want to get their autograph, their autographed copy of the, the DVD or a picture. They want to pick up like a big stuffy plushed animal. They want to get pieces for their cosplay. Um, you know, they want goes, people to take pictures of them in their cosplay. They're yeah. not even there to buy anything. They're there to get attention. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, people people go to fan conventions to be fans. They don't go to buy books. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like you want them to be a fan. So that's that's how you get them to engage. You get you get interested in them, they get interested in. Uh, and then you make sales. Uh, and that that comes from years and years and years of having worked uh, events, conventions, fan conventions as a sword dealer. I learned about people. I learned about being a friendly guy and, and just being engaging. I don't immediately talk about my product. I talk about them. Like they yeah. walk up. Everybody's got their geek on. Like they got their T-shirts. They've got Inuyasha t-shirts. They've got their cosplay. Talk about their cosplay. They're carrying like swag. Talk about their swag. Get them involved, you know? Yeah. Let them know you're a fan too, and they will definitely reciprocate. And that's how you make sales. Yeah. I, was, I, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I'm just, the odd thing. <laughs> oh, video version is different than the audio version. Um, I just doing the booth as a podcaster is way different doing the booth as when you're selling something. And I always feel like I'm more connected when I'm actually selling something. Cause I actually have a point to make other than, yeah, we're doing this thing over here. Like, Oh, okay. But if I'm selling something, Hey, what do you like? Maybe I got something that you like, you know, uh, uh, what's going on. Hey, see this thing. Oh, like, Oh yeah. That reminds me of such and such. You're carrying that conversation versus the podcast. Like, so what do you do? Like, well, what are you into? And then you try to relate that and you still find yourself just trying to sell the podcast. It's like, you know, I don't care no more. <laughs> it's like, just yeah. if you're interested, come by when we're doing the thing with around this time. Um, are you, you know, it's like, are you selling anything? Are you interested? Like, like who around here are you interested in? And like you, you, you almost got to drag it out of them a little bit because they're really only asking about you as a podcaster because they're bored or they're scooping out the competition. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, I, if, if you make a fan convention about the fans, I think they appreciate that because yeah. like everyone goes to those things to cut loose. You know, they, people go to comic cons to find their fellow freaks. Uh, they go there to show off, you know, um, it's, it's like a big social event. So get social, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> translating that by the way, into, into the internet was difficult. Um, I had to learn, and I was before the whole COVID thing, I was already kind of learning to engage uh, social online communities. Um, excuse me, sorry about that. So um, there, there's different kinds of communities. There's different kinds of reciprocation. Uh, and there's different kinds of cred that you have to build. So if it's a Facebook group, um, just shooting the shit like about like your favorite horror gets people interested in you gets people interested in what you do and then you can have that conversation uh if it's uh, a sales group just throw it out there talk about it see what other people are talking about mention yourself but never just mention yourself mention the things that inspire you as well like you know like do do your fellow indie guys a favor like if someone's like I'm looking for some good found footage. I always talk about like yellow brick road or butterfly kisses. Uh, don't, if it's, if it's always about you, people start to get kind of like, a, a, they, they but, get but a, don't sell a, yourself short. 
Don't, don't, don't like I asked Lloyd Kaufman, what, what, you know, what's a movie that you wish more people uh, uh, saw that, you know, a movie that you worked on that you wish more people saw. And then he started talking about guardians of the galaxy. Cause he just wanted to promote that James Gunn he used to work with him. It's like, I think you missed the question and an opportunity. <laughs> sort of. Like, I think, I think people really appreciate it if you like the same stuff they like, and then they get more interested in what you're selling. If, if you make it personal, if you make a connection, you make a sale. Uh, and that's something I've learned throughout, like, you know, doing conventions and fan shows. Um, and then like, so that's, that's Facebook. Twitter is different. Twitter, like you basically just have to shoot the shit and then people go check you out naturally. Um, like, so it's, it's hard to build up an audience on Twitter. Uh, it happens quicker than on Facebook, but it takes a while. Um, and then there's Reddit where basically it's just uh, the gauntlet of trolls. And if you know how to handle the gauntlet of trolls, people respect you and they'll they'll be interested in you. Um, but like Reddit, Reddit is like like a next level kind of internet persona because yeah, only- I, I've never really got too much into Reddit. I, yeah, I, I, and I I just hear so many different odd stories. Like like They're it awesome. used to be, you know, it was just one because I used to go to one place for my memes and those places kind of dried up and then like, well, you gotta go to Reddit now. And now that place, it didn't dry up, but it kind of got a little political where if you're, you know, where things moved in a totally different weird direction where you can make jokes unless you're in a deep subreddit where you had to no, was it, you have to subscribe to that subreddit in order to see it now versus yeah. just browsing. Yeah. yeah like I don't want to go that deep. I just don't have the time. I, I'd like, you know, if I could cool, but I just don't have the time. Man, it's the worst. Like th- there are so many people on Reddit who have been on Reddit long enough to believe that they, they have this weird ownership over it. And they have like this strange, like I am Reddit kind of attitude. And it's yeah. just like, dude, you're an internet troll. Shut the fuck up and move on. And and I'll even go so far to say as that attitude kills conventions because there's conventions I go to that yeah. they're like, I've been coming here for 10 years. Look, here's every one of my badges and I'm wearing them. And like, no one Nobody cares, knows. dude. Yeah. You're like, hey, is this your first year? Sit down and shut up. Like, whoa, what is wrong with you? Yeah, come on. We're all here to have a good time. Apparently, yeah, I we're... don't care if this is your first one, fifth one, 20th one, however long the convention been around. Every uh, every convention has its name heads and nobody likes them. And you kind of wonder how they, they justify to keep coming back because nobody likes them. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, we're, we're we're getting to that time. Is there anything you want to prop out? This is your time to either tell one more story or you can tell that story and then you can go ahead and prop everything out you want to prop out. No, I'm just going to shamelessly plug myself. All right. Um, In the Shadow of the Mountain, that's a uh, dollar for the ebook on Madness Hard Press. Uh, currently, uh, this is my newest one, which is in the beginning. These are all cosmic horrors. Uh, they're like cosmic horror creature features. If you like uh, the stylings of things similar to H.P. Lovecraft, I'm working on a series with uh, the writer John Baltusberger, who is the Mad Kaiju poet. The first in the series of uh, that follows the the unnatural perpetrators department division of the FBI. Uh, think X Files meets Dresden Files. That's in Human Error. This is completely free for the ebook. Go to madisheart.press, and that is a completely free download. The second in the series, which is Artifice of Flesh, is only a dollar for the ebook. We do have physical copies if you want them. Obviously, they'll be a little bit more expensive. The next in the UPD series is coming out over September and October. Currently, the working title is Ethereal Rage. And then 2021, Parabiosis, my underwater horror, which is also cosmic horror because I love cosmic horror creature features. Uh, don't forget to check in Monday for my podcast, which is the nightmarefeed.com. That's the nightmarefeed.com, uh, the podcast. Actually, I think it's just nightmarefeed.com. Damn, I'm terrible at this. Nightmarefeed.com podcast. Go check us out every Monday. We do uh, horror news, horror media, and horror opinions. And then finally, 
check out Reed Alexander's horror review. If you just Google Reed Alexander's horror review, you'll find my go my uh, vocal page. You can also find Reed Alexander's horror review on Facebook. It's Reed's horror on Twitter. That's at Reed's horror on Twitter. Uh, and then uh, I think that's it. Was the nightmares? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I'm Toden from Toden's Media Letter Sandwich. You can find all the episodes at Toden.com, Media Letter Sandwich.com. We're on DV Radio. Dot net every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm in the chat room. And if you want to be the first person to do, go ahead and check out the Patreon slash Toten. That's not just for the podcast. That's also for other video things I'm working on and back to the conventions and all that stuff when we get to get back there. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed our, uh, hope you enjoyed our conversation. And may the algorithms be in your favor. <laughs> And the next episode of Media Litter Sandwich. So I am an independent author with uh, 23 books out, big range of science fiction and fantasy. I also head up a charity press because we do uh, punk science fiction to benefit uh, Paws Animal Rescue in Linwood. And his uh, reference was some of our books are used in currently six different high school systems and uh, one university.